these people, they want to take out Jews. They want to take out Christians. They want to take out the Arabs who live peacefully here in Israel. They just don't want Israel to exist. It's the only country that is constantly fighting simply for the right to exist. And people keep asking me why I'm being so outspoken about this issue because I'm not Jewish. I'm not Israeli. I'm just somebody with eyes. And I see the horror that's been caused here. And there is nothing that could possibly justify what I'm witnessing right now. And I will continue to stand in solidarity with Israel because this just is not, this isn't right. So a year ago, I didn't know much about Israel. I had always heard conflicting narratives about what goes on there, what the culture is like. I just basically had a general understanding that they were always defending themselves. So when I was invited to go, I was really interested. Within my first day there, I fell in love with Israel. I loved the culture, the people, the Christian sites, the Jewish sites, learning about Muslim culture. I was just learning about history and all these different amazing aspects of what Israel has to offer. And what I didn't expect is that as soon as I had announced that I was going or that I came back, people were already attacking me. People were attacking me with anti-Semitic remarks, being mad that I went to Israel, and that was just very alarming to me. I didn't realize how hostile the dynamic was about discussing Israel. And that was in June of 2023. So fast forward a few months later, I started speaking out about anti-Semitism. I started pointing out just how bizarre this hatred people had towards the Jewish community was around August of 2023. So then when we get to October 7th of 2023, I was completely devastated by what happened over in Israel and learning about 1,300 plus people who were brutally murdered. And my initial thought was concern. I was concerned for all the friends I had made while I was there, all the people that I just completely admired and thought were such amazing people. And I started reaching out to them and just hoping that the media wouldn't let this be another story that just gets swept under the rug. What I was completely dumbfounded by was the fact that in less than 24 hours, the narratives about Israel were completely flipped. There were so many fraudulent headlines saying that Israel was lying or that this never happened and that these attacks never happened. Or some people were saying that they did happen, but that Israel deserved it. And then suddenly Israel became this apartheid state and this racist country. And it was like the floodgates of propaganda just unleashed on Israel. The fact that people try to deny what happens there is probably the most bizarre, ignorant thing I've ever heard because I have watched the 47 minute film of a compilation of videos of what happened on October 7th. Hamas was so proud of what they did. These disgusting, musty terrorists went there with GoPros on their heads so they could showcase the evil that they were doing. I saw on the videos that they would call their family members bragging to their mothers saying that they killed 10 Jews and that they did it for Allah and taking these hostages home back to Gaza, these women who were visibly raped and beaten and battered, sometimes even dead, and watching these Palestinians run up and spitting on them and punching them and kicking them. And I just did not realize until watching that film, just how evil humanity is still willing to be. So the more I began to speak out about Israel, the more backlash I began to receive. I had so many death threats coming my way. I had to go to the police station multiple times and just let them know that these evil anti-Zionists, anti-Semites were angry that I was speaking up about the truth. But one of the things that people kept saying to me over and over again is, you're black, you should be standing with the Palestinians. Do you know that Israel's racist? Do you know Israel doesn't like people like you? Israel doesn't like black people? And at this point, I just knew I had to go back to Israel. So I did. So there is a reason why they came for the old neighborhood because you don't have Mamadi, you don't have a safe rooms on in the old stone say on the that neighborhood. And that and what's happening is that in that case when you hire hiring a siren, you have to run outside. Half of the people, half of the people that been slaughtered here were slaughtered on the way to the safe room because the terrorists were waiting them outside. You're gonna see it very clearly very soon. So on January 8th of 2024, I landed in Israel. And one of the first places we went was Ofakim. Right here in Ofakim, near the Gaza border, homes are shot up, living rooms bombed out, melted clocks marking the time that terrorists attacked and children searching for anything that tells the story of what happened to their families. It's this small town pretty close to the Gaza envelope 
where Hamas apparently, for Lord knows how long, had been studying the way of life of these people. And what they knew is just how vulnerable the people of Ovakim were. And especially in this area of town where it was a considered an older part of town where they did not have safe rooms within their homes, they had a safe room outside. So just to show how strategic these evil people were, they camped out next to the safe room waiting for people to run to the safe room so that they could gun them down. To this day, you can still see blood splatter all over the streets, bullet holes and all over people's homes. And we were given a tour by one of the strongest men I've ever met in my life. People always talk about like, what does it mean to be masculine? I feel like this gentleman was the epitome of masculinity because when it came down to it, instead of hiding in his home and protecting himself, he decided to fight back. And I think that he's a hero that needs to be recognized. And he was telling his story of how he would get, he got up on the fence and he was shooting down these terrorists and doing everything that he could to save as many lives as possible, fighting back against these terrorists. And, and at that time, the injured terrorist that is lying down right here. Uh, yeah, shooting a uh, grenade towards here. I do not, I do not realize that uh, it was a, a grenade, but only after it uh, exploded, I'm starting to run about six meters away from me. And I feel like small stones that are hitting on me. And I, I thought it was like, uh, just like, yeah, I'm injured. But it's like I realized it was nothing. It was like just stones from uh, from the uh, from the from the ground. You know, I didn't know how to mentally prepare going to a community like Ofakim and just seeing the devastation. It really broke me when I heard children playing because it just reminded me how interrupted their ways of life is. And hearing the kids playing and trying to make the best of their situation, knowing that many of their friends have been murdered or for some of them, their entire families have been murdered. And you just don't know how to prepare to see something that difficult let alone envision yourself in their shoes and knowing that this is the reality of their experience. I just can't imagine sitting there on a Saturday morning, just doing my morning routine, and I have to run for my life. I'm hearing bullets being shot. I'm seeing people dead on the streets, and this is where I have to hide. And just what goes through people's heads when they're hiding in here. They don't know how long they're gonna be here. They don't know if they're gonna make it out of here. They don't know if their entire community is being burned down or gunned down or about to explode. Like, I can't imagine the horrors of sitting here in these walls. One of the next places we went was Kafar Aza, and that was one of the most devastated kibbutz, or basically a small village um, over in the Gaza envelope area where many of the kibbutz were completely destroyed. Militants went house to house, systematically executing the families inside. 66 people found dead on this street alone. A lot of children? A lot of children. Some of the children tried to hide behind these bushes, and they found them and they slaughtered them and they were happy. When you walk through Kafar Aza, it's just, it's like you can still smell the gunpowder and the residue and you can feel the pain in that community. You know, to this day, I just feel like my words will never do justice to what happened there. And knowing that Kafar Aza was a largely young community where people were just starting out their lives. You had engaged couples who were slaughtered in their homes. You see their blood all over the wall. You know the stories of them being burned alive, of babies being put into ovens. It's just evil. That's all I can really say about it. So right now we're just a few minutes away from Gaza, about one and a half miles. So just for protection, you know, this is a safe area, but we still need our bulletproof vests so that we're just extra protected. A lot of people are gonna be wearing helmets as well, uh, just for all safety protocols. I'm hearing so many bombs, so many reactions of Israel retaliating to Gaza and Hamas attacks or attacks. So right now it's just better to be safe than sorry. See the doorknobs that are ripped off the handles. You can see where the explosions were. You can see bullet holes everywhere. The fact that these monsters just went in and kidnapped these kids and dragged them over to Gaza and for what? And like, what is the reason? Simply because you don't want Jewish people to exist. Like how deep can your hatred possibly be for someone to cause this kind of chaos and devastation? People keep calling for a ceasefire, but these people still haven't even been returned home. There are still so many people, children even, who are over in Gaza right now being held hostage, who have done nothing wrong. All they've done is try to exist in peace, and this is the treatment that they're receiving. They didn't discriminate who they murdered. They didn't discriminate the kind of chaos they were causing. These people, they want to take out Jews. They want to take out Christians. They want to take out 
the Arabs to live peacefully here in Israel. They just don't want Israel to exist. It's the only country that is constantly fighting simply for the right to exist. And people keep asking me why I'm being so outspoken about this issue because I'm not Jewish. I'm not Israeli. I'm just somebody with eyes. And I see the horror that's been caused here. And there is nothing that could possibly justify what I'm witnessing right now. And I will continue to stand in solidarity with Israel because this just is not, this isn't right. And you see the holes just all around here just an insane amount of gunshots. It's been 95 days since October 7th and you still can smell and hear the residue of burning flesh and of decay in here. We also went to the side of the Know What Music Festival. This is where hundreds of people my age were just out dancing, enjoying lives, going about their way of life, which was, again, one of the reoccurring themes of people just enjoying their lives on this innocent Saturday. And then absolute mayhem is unleashed. Looking in closer detail at the shocking events of early on Saturday morning, you can see people dancing at the Nova Music Festival with no inkling of the horror that's about to unfold. BBC Verify has established that this was taken at sunrise on Saturday. And it's all happening just very, very close to the border between Israel and Gaza. So now I'm at the site of the Nova Music Festival where nearly 400 young, beautiful people were dancing and enjoying life and just and just having fun and being lighthearted. And they were all brutally murdered and slaughtered by Hamas. I just learned the story of David Newman, this young man was here with this girlfriend. They were in their early 20s. They were getting ready to get an apartment. And when Hamas came, they shot him. And what he did, he was a big guy, so he covered his girlfriend and sent his location over to one of his friends. And they were able to find his girlfriend. He unfortunately did perish. And at his funeral, they stretchered in his girlfriend so that she could speak on his behalf. So for those who want to say that this is not America's problem, this was an American Israeli. So this is an America, America problem as well. But more than anything, this is a human being. This is a humanitarian problem. And we can't let stories like David Newman's go untold. Something that I really admire and love and respect about Israel is no matter how tragic something is, they come together, they get stronger, and they just build more community than they've ever had before. You see over here, they're singing and dancing and praying and just embracing each other as a family. And learning the individual stories of these people just makes you realize, like, we have to do everything in our power to keep their memories alive. These were people with hobbies. These were people with passions. These were people who deserved to live a longer life. A lot of these people were in their early 20s or early 30s, and everything was taken away from them and from their loved ones. A question that people always ask me after my trip to Israel is, what takeaways do I want people to have? And there's really two. One is, I want people to realize the reality of what happened. I made them mistake before of saying that this was inhumane, but what happened in Israel just shows how far humans are willing to go to prove a point. The point that these people were trying to prove is that they hate Jews. They hate Israel. They hate anyone who doesn't believe in the thought process that they do. It, it's controversial for some reason to call these people jihadists, but as we know, these people who are living out jihad, they are killing every single person who does not worship the way that they want to worship or who they want them to worship. And we can't allow history to tell the wrong story. There's no such thing as being the good guy when you're out raping women and putting babies into ovens and stabbing them in the head and just doing the horrific things that are all on camera. These terrorists went as far as even taking the phones of some of these innocent people and recording themselves raping and murdering the innocent lives that they did and then sending that same video to the family members of the people who ju they just raped and murdered. So I really want people to understand the first takeaway is that Israel has the right to defend itself. Israel has a right to stand up against this evil because this isn't new. You can look at just history and there are dozens and dozens and dozens of times where Hamas has attacked Israel. Hamas is a terrorist organization. They're not a resistance group. They are a political group because they were elected. And I think that's an important point that we need to remember as well. But they are not going to stop at anything until all Israelis are dead, all Jews and Christians worldwide are dead, and all of Western society are dead. So for the people who say that this is not an American first issue, it 100% is because these people are ready to come and do the same devastation here as what they did over in Israel, but we are going to fight back. And that's why Israel has the right to defend itself. Israel is 
unequivocally our most important, valuable ally from even just a geopolitical standpoint. But that's a whole nother conversation. But what it really comes down to is humanity. In your opinion, why is the woke movement getting this conflict, the Israel-Hamas war, uh, so wrong? Do you think that it's a sort of oversimplification of, of taking uh, the conflict of racism that we've seen played out in the United States uh, and, and applying it to here in the Middle East where it's not a question of black and white here? It's this massive umbrella that you see on apps like TikTok, where I call it the bullying umbrella, where every single thing that they want to cancel, they put her under, under this umbrella. If you say that there's only two genders, they'll say you're transphobic. If you say that black people aren't oppressed in America and that we're not victims in America, they'll say that you're racist. And now they're saying that if you stand with Israel, you are genocidal somehow, which makes absolutely no sense considering Israel has been the ones combating against genocide for so long. But this is all their strategy. You have social media and that's the only outlet that most people, especially Gen Z and millennials, are getting their information from. And TikTok is intentionally fueling this fire by promoting the people who lie promoting the people who are just spreading the most incorrect information. But then when you try to put the truth out there, they'll not only suppress your account, but they will get you banned, they will get you blocked, and they will do everything in their power to make your life miserable because they would rather see you be silent than see you tell the truth. So my second takeaway is that the spirit of Israelis and the spirit of Jews and Christians worldwide is unbreakable and that Israel will live, the people of Israel will live, I'm Israel High.